to go with them, you can hit right now. And, and we're supposed to do something else right now, but that's okay. So those of you who are regulars around here know that um, I, I like props. Thank you for props. I like them. In Advent, we had a worship service where we talked about who we are in Jesus, and we, we wrote down names that we had defined ourselves by. We nailed them to a cross, and we picked up a new name that you couldn't see. You had to just trust that the Holy Spirit was going to lead you to that name. And, and, and I told you guys in Advent, when we did something like that at a retreat two years ago, I broke, that broke down broken, and I picked up whole. And in Advent, I went to our little wall, and I picked up whole. And I don't know which child handed this to me, but it says, whole. <laughs> so with that in mind, in case you had any doubts, he is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen, hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is risen indeed. Long live the king.
live the king. You know, those are, those are words that, that get spoken by a people who look at a king and say, that's the king we want to have continue to rule and reign. Long live the king. Galen, those are the words that we speak when the king comes back victorious and he's conquered the enemy and his citizens, his people look at him and say, we want to be part of that kingdom. So long live the king. <laughs> we want you to rule. We want you to reign. Guys, that's the declaration that we get to make today. <laughs> long live this king. Long live the king who's called us by name. Long live the king who's given us new names. Long live the king who has conquered every enemy there ever will be, and that includes death. Today, guys, what we're going to do is just celebrate this king. See, I've got, I have one goal, and I'm going to tell it to you up front. I'm not sneaky. I'm not going to hide it. i got one goal. I want every person in this room, by the end of today, to be willing to say, whether for the first time or all over again, that's my king. And I want to serve him with everything that I have. You see, we don't serve a king who we don't know. <laughs> we don't serve a king who we can't see. We don't serve a king who isn't here and alive and present. We serve a king who says, I want you to know who I am. And that's why he's given us his word. So I'm going to ask you if you would open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians is in the New Testament. Uh, it's after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's one of the letters that Paul wrote. We're going to go to chapter 15. We're going to pick up in verse 50. Now, I'm, I'm saving us some time today. I'm, I'm, I'm being uh, rust conscious. The, there you go. You may thank him later. Yes. The first, for all 58 verses of 1 Corinthians 15 is simply about the fact that our king is alive. For 49 solid verses, all Paul establishes is that Jesus is the king and that he is the king. That's it. He spends 49 verses saying, I want to do any image I can give you, uh, any, any language I can use, any analogy I can throw out there. Jesus is the king, and the king has risen. By the time we hit verse 50, Rainy, Paul says, okay, okay, I'm assuming that you've tracked with me up until this point. I'm assuming that you at least believe that I think that the king has risen. And so when you hit verse 50, Paul starts to say, so I want to tell you why it matters. And what we're going to find that Paul does is, is he kind of gives us corrective lenses. I see a lot of glasses here, so I'm assuming most of us have been to the optometrist at some point. You know, when you go to the optometrist and he, and my guy, he, <laughs> I go to kind of an inexpensive guy, nothing's up to date there. So he swings this, I don't know, bank of lenses from the right, and they come in and he starts clickety-clacking and things and getting it, do you like this, do you like that? And you pretty much have to close your eyes and go, no, I hate it all, stop. And then he swings this next set of lenses in from the left, and he click and he clacks that thing around too, until all of a sudden you, you can't see anything, and then everything's perfect. Okay. What Paul's going to give us here is a set of lenses. He says Jesus is in fact alive, and he says that reality, the reality of an empty tomb and the reality of a cross, he says if we can look through them, then we will see with a clarity that we can never see otherwise. When we look at what took place on Holy Week, we look at an empty tomb, we look at that cross, then we will see that we have a king. A king who we'd want to serve. A king we want to look at and shout, long live the king. So let's hear what Paul has to say, then we'll go back and we'll unpack it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 50 and reading through to the end, Paul says this, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the imperish, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, 
He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is the word of our God, and our thanks belongs to him. Amen? Oh, it's Easter, and there's a baptism. I lie for us. Paul starts this passage, right, by saying, I want to tell you a mystery. Becky, when, when Paul talks about mystery, and he likes to throw that word around in, in the letters that he writes, he does not mean, I want to tell you something that, up into, that no one's smart enough to figure out. <laughs> I want to give you secret knowledge. When Paul talks about a mystery, Leslie, what he's saying is, I want to tell you about something that, that you could only understand if you look at it through the lens of the tomb and the lens of the cross. Paul says, I want to tell you a truth that God put into place all the way back at the beginning, all the way back in Genesis, but if you were living it and you looked forward, you couldn't see it. He says, it's only when we put on the lens of the tomb and we look through the lens of the cross that we can see what's been there all along. So let's take away the lens for a second. Because the first lens that he talks about, April, is the lens of the empty tomb. But if we don't look through it, you don't look through the fact that there is an empty tomb, that Jesus is alive, that he did, in fact, raise again. Then if all I do is look to me, what I see with my eyes is that death is going to swallow every one of us up. That's my reality, right? The truth of the matter is, though nobody likes to say it, that the, from the moment we are conceived in our mother's womb, we are one second closer to what is an inevitable death. The reality is we are, in fact, born to die. Every one of us. From this side of glory, if I look not through the lens of the cross or the lens of the empty tomb, all I can recognize is this one truth. There is an enemy that I don't care how hard you work, how healthy you may be, how, how vigilant about life you might be. You'd be the best driver on the face of the planet. You got all the rewards from your insurance company. I don't, but maybe you do. And all it takes is one drunk driver. And your heartbeat stops. Death, from our perspective, looks like it's going to swallow up every last one of it. It's a question of when. I might make it to 103 years old, be one of those people that they interview and say, what's your secret? And say, well, I, you know, I drank a raw egg every day. It's always random, their answer. But the end result is that death's going to swallow me up. And it did. Every single human being, save for one. See, Ashley, when I look at my life through the lens of the empty tomb, suddenly something gets reversed. <laughs> See, death did not swallow up Jesus Christ. Jesus swallowed up death. Right? See, that's why the tomb matters. The cross is incredibly significant, but guys, that's how I get access to Jesus Christ. But if Jesus had stayed dead, you and I are sunk. The beginning of chapter 15, which we didn't read for Russ's benefit, Paul says, Hi, Russ. <laughs> Paul says at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we, of all people on the face of the planet, are to be the most pitied because we believe a lie. But Bridget, Jesus is a lie. He did, in fact, raise from the dead. Death did not swallow him. He swallowed death. And that means death is dead. Do you know that? Jesus is alive, and death is dead. Yvonne, Paul quotes from Isaiah 25 when he talks about this mystery, right? The thing that Isaiah prophesied some 700 years before God took on flesh, dwelt among us, and swallowed up death. And when Isaiah prophesied, he couldn't have had a clue what it meant, because <laughs> it's a mystery, one I can only see through the lens of the tomb. But Isaiah 25 reads like this. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples. He will destroy the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. That's what Easter's about. So Joel, when Paul talks about this mystery, he says, here's, here's the mystery. 
it looks, from my human perspective, like one day death's going to swallow me up. It looks from my human perspective like one day I, I'm going to uh, be the body in the casket and everybody's going to be gathered around me. But when I look through the lens of the empty tomb, I know death has been swallowed up. And so you know what that means, right? <coughs> Paul says, here's the mystery. Paul says, the mystery is that one day you and I are not going to be dead. And he begins to talk in a language that he has to make up. Eugene, he doesn't have words for it. All he knows is what you and I know. All we know is a, a, a perishable body, right? Bodies that get old. Bodies that become arthritic. Eyes that fade and, and, and can no longer see. And some go all the way blind. Ears that go deaf. All we know is bodies that get cancer. We know about hearts that are ticking time bombs that nobody knows about until it's too late. All we know about is a body that eventually falls to pieces. And so Paul says, I'm going to make up some words. <laughs> he says, one thing I know, if Jesus swallowed up death, then I will take my last breath on this earth, but I will take my first in glory. And on that day, this perishable body is going to put on imperishability. I wonder what that's going to be like. <laughs> I don't have a clue. All I know is that it's beyond my words. All I know is that I, I get little glimmers of it. You know, a couple years ago, I, I buried my, my uncle Mike. I did his funeral service. Mike was profoundly autistic. Um, blind in one eye, never able to speak. Uncle Mike was nonverbal. Uh, I used to think he was the most verbal, nonverbal person I'd ever met. But he could not speak a word. My granny never heard her son say, Mom. Never heard him say, I love you. He, he couldn't speak. And Jeremy, here's what I know. I know that I stood at his graveside and it looked like death swallowed my Uncle Mike. But I know for a fact that Jesus Christ swallowed up death. And I know that one day my Uncle Mike's going to stand in front of Jesus. And do you know he's going to speak? Yeah. Every word is going to come out of that man's mouth. For the first time in my life when I get to glory, I'm going to have a conversation with Uncle Mike. Yeah. I know that that's true. I know that my mother, for my entire lifetime, I mean, since I was knee-high to a grasshopper, has had such horrible arthritis that she ought to be in a wheelchair somewhere. She should not be out there walking and moving. I, I can remember her taking us for hikes as kids, tears streaming because she was in so much physical pain. Someday, my mom's going to run. I mean, I ain't never seen that woman run. <laughs> She's going to run. And the only tears are going to be ones of joy. Yes. Okay, that's the promise that we have. The promise that we have in Jesus Christ, the hope that we have is that we can look. We can look soberly. We can look clearly. We can look at bodies that break. We can look at people that are dying. We can look at things and say, that is not right. But look through the limbs of the empty tomb and suddenly something's going to come clear. For anybody who is a citizen of this king, one day, one day, we're going to know the truth that Jesus swallowed up death. One day, we're going to know what it is to put on immortality and imperishability and to be changed, to be able to live for all of eternity in the presence of Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you a little secret. It is only for those who are the king's citizens. Now, this is a promise, Chris, that Jesus has offered to absolutely anybody. He did not just swallow up death for you and me. He swallowed up death for everyone. But I've got to look at him and say, long live my king. In order to receive that promise, to look through that lens and know that I'm not just looking at something I can hope for, I can bank on it. I've got to give my life to Jesus. And that means the declaration of saying, you're my king. Friends, that's the promise that you and I have. I, I want to be able, I want people to come to my funeral one day, and, and I want somebody to hand them a box of tissues and say, get it over with, now you're done. Because she's the happiest she's ever going to be, and she wants you there too. Long live the king. When Paul keeps going in verse 56, he changes images. Paul likes as many images as he can come up with. And the next one that, that he got, Paul gets all carried away. Go, you can go ahead and bring it up. It's gross. Yuck. I'm going to look over here. Verse 56, right? Paul begins 
He just said, when we look through this image of the empty tomb, we know the truth that Jesus swallows up the death that we think is going to swallow us up, that we will live for eternity in the presence of our God, imperishable and immortal. Jamie, in verse 56, Paul kind of switches gears, though. And he says, you know what? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Now, we got to unpack that for a second. See, Paul's just a good theologian. He just knows the Bible. He knows that, that God's will is perfect and right, and so he's just unpacking it, right? Paul says this. He says, listen, do you know why we die? It's not actually because our bodies fall apart. It's because sin got introduced into the picture, right? Go back to the Garden of Eden. Go back to the very beginning. Go back to Genesis. We go back to Genesis, and our very good king put his citizens inside a perfect kingdom, right? Put us in the Garden of Eden. And he said to Adam and Eve, you can eat of any tree except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? He said, you can have anything that you want, just don't eat of this one tree. Because why? What's going to happen if you do it? You will surely die, right? The Lord looked at Adam and Eve and he said, you can eat of anything, anything at all, but if you break my rule, if you don't trust me to have what's best for you, you will die. And that's what happened, right? They looked at the Father, they said, we don't trust that you actually love us, we don't trust that you actually know what's best for us, and they decided to eat of that fruit. And the next thing that happens is death comes. <coughs> the sting of death is sin. Paul's using the image of a scorpion, right? He says that picture that scorpion and that nasty little stinger there in the back. He says the poison that actually kills us, the poison that causes this world to be a mess, the poison that causes our bodies to fall apart, the poison that leads to death. He says it's sin. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Now, what's he mean by that? Aaliyah, Paul's just pointing out a very, very simple reality. He says, what causes me to sin is my knowledge of God's law. You know why? I'm stupid. <laughs> Not you, of course. <laughs> go back to the garden again, right? We go back to the garden, and we've got a very good king who is a very good father. And like any good parent, he looks at his kids and he says, here's the law. If you go outside the law, you're going to get hurt. If you live inside my law, you will live. Right? It's like, it's like the parent that looks at their kid who's holding a, a lovely metal fork. And the parent says to their child, if you take the metal fork and you stick it in the electric socket, you're going to die. Okay? You do not say that to your child because you are mean and evil and you are trying to prevent them from having fun. Is because you love your kid, you know they're a little on the dumb side, and you'd like them not to die. Okay? <laughs> Same good parent looks at their child, says, take your lovely metal fork, if you put it in the dinner that I made for you and you eat, then you're going to live. God the Father looked at Adam and Eve and he said, if you take the metal fork and you stick it in that tree, you're going to die. Eat of anything else and you will live. But that's a question of trust, right? It's a question of us looking at our very good father and saying, do I trust that you love me? Do I trust that you're good? Do I trust that you care about me? If I don't trust you, then I think you're robbing me and I stick my fork in the electric socket. If I do trust my father, then I live in accordance with his will. So catch what Paul says. The sting of death is sin. That's what poisons me. That's what causes death. And the power of death, the power of sin, is the law. The power that's going to draw me to sin is every time I look at my father and I don't trust that he's good. Now, if I look at God's will through my eyes, I start to wonder whether it's good or not. I begin to look at that, that lovely fork and think that the electric socket probably has something I really want. But if I look through the lens of the cross, things start to come into perspective. Eugene, if I look through the lens of the cross, I see two things. First, what I see is that Jesus got stung. That every bit of the deadly poison of the scorpion that is my sin stung my Savior. 
stung him so much that he did, in fact, die. That he who was sinless took all of the poison from all of my distrust of the Father on himself to the point that he died. You know what that means? It means he ripped the stinger off the scorpion comes. It means that you and I, though there will be consequences for our sin, if we are citizens of this king's kingdom, we will not surely die. We will not know separation from God the Father because Jesus took it all. There's no poison left. The scorpion, he doesn't have any power anymore. I look through the cross. That's what I see. And if I keep looking through the cross, you know what else I see? I see a father who loved me so much that he said, I will do whatever it takes to convince you that I'm trustworthy. I will even allow my son to die your death. You know, when I look through the lens of the cross at my father's law, I look through the lens of the cross at, at the power and the, of the sting of sin, all I can see is I've got a father whose love for me is perfect. And so when he says, don't stick it in the electric socket, I'm not going to do it. I see a father who said I would give my son so that you won't get stung anymore. The promise that we have in that, Paul says, Paul goes on, right, and he says, thanks be to God. He has given us the victory. He's given us the victory over the sting of sin. He's given us victory over the law that, that is the power of sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. When I look through that lens, what I discover, and this was amazing, right? I don't have to keep living the same old life. Did you know that? I look through the empty tomb and I say, I will live for all of eternity in the presence of God. I look through the cross and say, and I can live today. You know, I don't have to wait until glory to begin to become more and more like my Savior. I have to wait until glory to begin to say, Father, I trust you and I want to live your good and perfect will in my life. I can do that today. And when I look at the cross, it's about the only thing I want to do. Let me tell you a little secret. Here's one of Paul's mysteries, right? It's the king's kids. It's the members of the king's kingdom. It's the people who look at Jesus and say, I believe that on the cross you got stunned by my sin. It's the people that look at Jesus and say, I believe that on the cross the Father has shown me perfect love who today stand forgiven, who have the victory of over our sin through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the choice you and I got to make. But it's a choice we can make today. You now Paul finishes there in verse 58. And he says, therefore, as I look through the lens of the empty tomb, and I know that Jesus has swallowed up death, and it will not swallow me up. When I look through the lens of the cross, and I can see, I can see that my Savior took all of this thing, and that my Father's love is perfect. Therefore, Paul says, Live for the king. He doesn't say, therefore, wait until heaven. He says, therefore, today, here and now, make the choice to live for the king. Because that's what Easter is. Easter is the ultimate invitation to look at Jesus and say, that's my king. Now, for some of us here today, you have never heard the gospel before. For some of us today, you've heard it, and you could quote it, you could preach it better than I can. And Jesus is not your king. For some of us today, there isn't a knowledge in your heart and spirit that he really, truly went to your cross and died your death so that today you can live. That's how real your love is for me. I want to know what it is today to live victorious in you. This is the day that we look through the empty tomb and say, I want to know with certainty that I will live forever. If you don't know Jesus as Savior Lord, today's the day that you get to say, Jesus, I want to know you. You know, he does not require that you read the Bible backwards and forwards. Uh, he, you will, and you'll fall in love with him as you do it. He doesn't require that you clean your life up. Like, he does not look and say, get yourself cleaned up before you get in the shower, right? He says, come to me today. I want to be your king. Some of us here, you know Jesus is 
You know it without question, without doubt. You rejoice in that truth. And you know what? You need to go back to the optometrist because your prescription's a little off. And maybe today, for those of us who know Jesus as King, what we need to do is let him correct our vision. Because sometimes, guys, it gets a little off. Sometimes we forget and we begin to look and say, you know what, death is going to swallow me up. And we forget the promise that is ours, that there will be a day when we will put on what is imperishable. And we got to look through the empty tomb and be reminded of that, even if in this moment your body's falling apart. Some of us, we need to look through the empty cross. And we need to be able to say, Jesus, you really did die my death. I don't just teach that to the children in Sunday school. That changes me today. Because he's the king. He's the king we want to be able to say, long live the king. I'm going to ask that we close our eyes, that we come before that king in prayer right now. If you don't know Jesus, then I pray that today would be the day that you, you just have a conversation with him. You invite him to become your king. If Jesus is the king, then I'm going to invite you to come before him today and, and invite him to speak to you about what lens he most needs you to look through. What's he correcting about your vision? That you can look through and see a king who you want to live for, for your whole life. Jesus, give us eyes to see the truth. Let us see the mysteries that Paul talks about. Let's look at this world with, with your lenses put over our eyes. Father, I pray for every one of us today that we would be able to look through an empty tomb. And we would recognize that death could not hold you. That hell could not keep you. That, that nothing could stop you from causing death to die. And so we too shall live. Lord, I pray that today we would be able to look with that lens. Lord, even as, as bodies fall apart today, God, may we look with the hope, the sure and certain hope that is ours. We will not all fall asleep, but we will be changed. That our mortal, perishable bodies will be clothed with immortality. They will become imperishable. Lord, may we stand on that promise today that Jesus, because you have overcome the grave, so too shall we. Lord, I pray that you would give us the eyes to see that truth today. To be able to look even at what's fallen apart around us, and maybe it's not us, maybe it's the person that we love, and to look with that vision. To know that for all the citizens of your kingdom, that promise is ours. You swallowed up our death. And then, Lord, I ask that you give us the ability to look through the lens of, of the cross. Father, that we would look at you through the lens of the cross, and we would be utterly convinced that you're a good Father. That your love for us is perfect. That your ways are good and right. Uh, Lord, show us where we have stopped looking through that lens. We've gotten skewed in our vision. Show us, Father, the places where we have refused to trust you, the places where we refuse to obey you, the places where we, we say yes to what you said no to, we say no where you say yes. Give us a clear picture. Give us a corrective lens as we look through the cross, that, Father, with our whole lives, we might know the victory that is ours in Jesus Christ, the victory over the sting of death and the power that is the law. Lord, we come today as your kids. And we declare with our lives, long live the King. Lord,
Lord, may you be king, truly and completely, over our lives. Thanks for loving us, Jesus. We pray these things, Lord God, in your name. And all God's people said, Amen.